人有。We've formed a quorum and it's the appointed time. District Calling Services Bill, Bills Committee, Item One. Election of Chairman. The procedures for election of the Chairman are set out in Appendix Four to the House Rules. Any nomination for the Chairman? A nomination should be made orally by a member, and seconded by another member orally, and the nominee must also give consent. Mr. Tony Chair. Dr. Le Wai Kwok, do you accept the nomination? I'm most happy. Any seconder? Yes. Sit Ho, any other nomination? If not, then congratulations, Dr. Le. Please come over and take over the chair. Members, is there a need to elect a deputy chairman? Mr. Seto said no. I don't think so. I don't think the workload will be too onerous, and we will um, not take too much time in scrutinising bill. Okay, meeting with the administration. So please invite the administration team in. Attending the meeting today are Mrs. Dorothy Ma, Principal Assistant Secretary for the Environment and Energy, Assistant Director of EMSD, Mr. Henry Harry Lai, Ms. Shina Yi, Assistant Secretary for the Environment and Energy. Mr. Peter C, Senior Government Counsel, Department of Justice, and Mr. Yip Mankin, Senior Engineer, Professional Support, 3 EMSG. So the administration would now, now like to take us through the bill, and then I'll open the floor to questions by members. Thank you, Chairman, uh, for giving us the opportunity to take you through the District Cooling Services Bill. Now, we're talking about the Kai Tech System. It is. It shouldn't be unfamiliar to members because at the PWSC and also the EA panel and development panel, we have also reported on the uh, project. We have been given support by the legal, and we've received around. Four or one million dollars, uh, forty million dollars for the funding, and the phase one has been completed. And phase one A will be completed in 2016. The project has started, and we have to do preparatory work for the charging of the system. So the bill provides for the charging of the system and also other matters. Upon the advice of the D of J, we need to have a legislative backing for our charging system. So, and we would uh, the EMSD will also be empowered to um, use the fees collected to offset the building of the system. Undoubtedly, this is a an environmental friendly system. And it's in line with the development of the 
uh, contact development. This is this can save energy. We hope to provide air conditioning for 1.73 million square meters of non-domestic air conditioned gross floor areas. Compared to conventional air conditioning system, it can save more energy. And compared to traditional air-cooled air conditioning systems, it can save up to 35% of energy. And compared to uh, water-cooled air conditioning systems, a saving can also be made uh, of 20% of electricity. So overall, we can save up to 85 million kilowatt hour, and there will be a reduction of 59,500 tons of carbon dioxide emission. There are other benefits to the system. We can also help us save uh, the upfront capital cost for installing chilling chiller plants and in individual buildings. And there will also be more flexible building designs. We can also reduce uh, vibration and noise um, arising from individual air conditioning systems. And the bill also provides a legislative backing for our charging. And so in the appendix, we have proposed a charging scheme here. Um, the overall principle is that we should recover the costs in 30 years. And we think taxpayers should not be asked uh, to subsidize the system, so we want to recover the costs for the system. Um, perhaps on the charging scheme, I would ask um, Mr. Lai to talk about it from the EMSD. Well, we've got a PowerPoint presentation with us. The system has been presented at the relevant electrical panel. This is a central cooling system, and its uh, special characteristic is that we would be concentrating all the chiller plants at a central um, station, and through the use of sea water, we would um, provide um, chilled water. And we can be able to. We are able to achieve high efficiency, and then um, through underground water pipes, we would be uh, distributing or sending the chilled water to the different buildings. Now, if you look at the diagram, um, there will be a heat exchanges in individual buildings, and through such heat exchanges, the chilled water can be turned into um, cooling system um, for. Uh, air conditioning chillers at different um, floors of the building. Just now, my colleague has uh, explained that the district cooling system, when compared to the air cooled conditioning system, we can save 35% of electricity, and compared to water cooled air conditioning system, we can save 20% of electricity. So upon the full commissioning of the system, we will be able to save 85 million kilowatts saving in electricity consumption, and we can reduce 59,500 tons of CO2 emission. Now, also, if we don't have this uh, central system, the individual building will have to install its users' um, own chillers normally at the rooftop, and then um, problems may arise. For example, noise, vibration, and heat problems. And if we um, put all the chillers in the, into a central station or plant, then there is no need for individual buildings to have their own chillers, and so the there will be reduced noise, vibration, and heat problems. And there will also be a reduction in the heat island effect. As buildings don't have to uh, reserve space, for building chillers, so there can be more flexible build designs. For example, take the um, cruise terminal as an example. It is now using the 
district cooling system, you can see that actually at the rooftop, uh, rooftop gardens can be built. And as we are using a central <coughs> system, now in terms of uh, demands, then uh, we would be able to cater to varying demands. For example, for some buildings, um, there may be different uh, air conditioning need needs at different periods. So we can, as a central system, we can readily cater to those needs. Now, within the dotted line is uh, the area where the um, system will cover. There are two plants now. Is it the northern plant at this area? And at the um, old runway, there is the southern plant. And actually, the southern plant is providing um, chilled water to the um, cruise terminal. And for the northern plant, we are providing to the Qinglong estate. And also, we are now laying pipes to provide chilled water to tea trade and industry tower, schools, and also Hong Kong Children's Hospital. So that will be for phase three. Now, the <coughs> red part is uh, pipelines um, to be built. So the blue lines indicate the pipelines which have already been laid. Now, upon the commissioning of the system, we can the total cooling capacity is 284,000 kilowatt hour. So that means 80,000 tons, and total ground under total underground pipe length 39 kilometers. Charging principles. So compared to the cost of the individual chillers, the um, Central cooling system will be charging at a uh, charge to be at a similar level. We want to recover the uh, capital and operating costs over 30 years. And the bill is aimed at providing legal backing for the collection of charges and other matters. And based on the charging scheme provided in the bill, we will be. Um, charging non-government buildings using the services. Charging proposal, two key tariff components. Well, that has been drawn up based on uh, taking reference from overseas experience. Uh, one is capacity charge and the other is consumption charge. <coughs> capacity, capacity charge, there is a tariff adjustment mechanism. And that will the annual adjustment will be based on the Composite Consumer Price Index (CCPI) consumption charge, and it will be adjusted annually to take into account the charge in electricity tariff rate. Based on the costs of the project and our estimates. And for 2014-15, the charging level is capacity charge is $112 kilowatt per month. And consumption charge, $0.19 kilowatt hour. Well, let me give you a typical example um, for your reference. For example, there is an office building. The ground floor area is around 60,000 uh, square meters. The cooling capacity demand would be around 7,000 kilowatt. And based on the formula mentioned just now, the estimated monthly capacity charge is around $800,000. And the estimated monthly consumption charge is $400,000. So the total charge will be per month is $1.2 million. So the estimated monthly charge per square meter is $20. So that's more or less on a par with um, the no, what, what, what is in the market, or, or rather just more on the low side. <coughs> the timetable. <coughs> we hope to collect charges from non-government users in July 2015. At which time uh, uh, 
the, the schools that you saw in the <coughs> plan just now will be uh, uh, completed and will be starting to charge the, uh, the tariffs. So that is our timetable. Uh, the main purpose of the bill is to uh, provide for matters relating to the district cooling services, including the imposition of charges for the service and to provide for other related matters. The bill is divided into six parts and two schedules. Part one would be the preliminary, which contains preliminary provisions uh, and also uh, interpretation of the bill. Part two, provision of district cooling services, stipulating how we would provide the services, application procedure for um, by consumers, circumstances under which uh, service would be suspended, and also circumstances under which uh, services could be resumed. There are also provisions for the application <clears throat> for cessation of the approval of consumer. Part three, it's in respect of charges for district cooling services, the variable charges, fees and deposits payable by consumers, method calculation, and also the capacity charge rate and the consumption charge rate, uh, and also the adjustment mechanism. Part 4 is about administration of the DCS. For example, we can issue an improvement notice to, the, to an approved consumer. We also we need to empower an authorized officer to enter the building for the purpose of inspection and maintenance and to provide for the offenses of obstructing an authorized officer and of tampering with our facilities. Part 5, Appeal. We, have, we propose to set up an appeal board and an appeal mechanism and uh, and also uh, we will provide for the, uh, the uh, rules and procedures for the proceedings of the appeal board. Part 6, miscellaneous matters. This is in respect of uh, uh, recovery of unpaid charges and also we can authorize staff of the EMSD uh, to uh, uh, specify a form to be read and also to amend schedules 1 and 2. Schedules 1 and 2 are respectively about the uh, <clears throat> uh, area covered by the DCS and also Schedule 2 is about the, the method of calculation of the charges. Thank you. Before we uh, uh, invite members to ask questions, Mr. Lai, uh, for the a DCS project. How is the progress today? Thank you, Chairman. I think I, if I may, go back to an earlier slide. I think you should uh, uh, give us more details uh, about the uh, the progress of the project because it has to do with uh, it. It's, it may affect our timetable. If I may use this. Uh, uh, slide uh, to explain. The project is divided into different stages. For stage one, we are actually <coughs> uh, working in tandem with the uh, uh, progress of the different stages of the uh, Kaite development. Phase one is laying of, uh, it's all about the laying of mains. The blue part <coughs> Uh, represents the laying of the mains. When the ocean terminal was built, you see that we already laid the mains there beforehand. For phase two, uh, uh, we will be building the uh, plants uh, uh, for to accommodate the uh, coolers. Well, this is located at the uh, uh, south runway. It's underground, and also there's another one to the north. The the, the plants to the south and the north would contain the, 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 uh, the uh, units that we will be using in the initial stage and that part of the project is almost completed. The units have already been installed and commissioned but it doesn't mean that we will be installing all the units. The units that we've installed only comprise a small portion. Uh, 
uh, basically they are now serving the facilities which have already been commissioned, including the uh, cruise terminal here, Qinglong Estate and the shopping mall, at the Kayib Estate and Takong Estate. And this is uh, phase two, which is near, nearing completion. Right now, we've already we've, we've already begun phase three of the project. The target buildings would be the uh, industrial and trade trade industry building, and uh, I think uh, uh, the the, main, the pipes that we're now laying will be the red ones here. C connecting to with mm, connecting the trade and industry tower and also at the Tech Long Estate there will be two schools uh, which will be commissioned next year and we will also uh, uh, be making connection with these two schools and also at near the Kaitek Hospital we will be laying this section of the mains uh, Supplying, <coughs> uh, serving the Kaitech Children Hospital. That would be phase 3A of the project. As for the remaining uh, stages, we will tie in with the EMSD's uh, uh, <coughs> a road construction program in the Kaitech area. So for this section of the road and, and the commercial uh, uh, development of the commercial sites here and also in the middle of the runway there will be sites for hotels and the roads there uh, we will uh, uh, work in tandem with the progress of those works and lay the, the mains and increase the number of uh, units <coughs> in the uh, substation accordingly so the south, in the southern plant, some of the units have already been installed. They're already serving the Kaitech cruise terminal. So we don't have the legislation yet. So how are you going to, how, how can you provide services and char, charge them now? Well, the cruise terminal is a government facility. As I said, this bill applies to non-government uh, uses the Kaita Cruise Terminal and the Ching the shopping mall at Chingwa Estate are <coughs> op uh, managed by the housing department, whereas the cruise terminal is under the, the jurisdiction of the tourism uh, 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 commission. Of so, so, so it, we are imposing charges on these uh, users uh, according to internal government's uh, internal arrangements. So you you are already ch charging the tariffs, but you are doing so uh, uh, according to the internal procedures of the government. This is ba all about the method of calculation. Uh, so there is no formal charge, but we will work out the uh, <clears throat> amount of cooling water used, the capacity which has been which is required, and. And then for we will work out how much a non-government user would need to pay, and then notionally we will we will uh, <coughs> uh, provide for that amount. Well, another related question is that how would the ocean uh, the the, uh, the cruise terminal charge its own tenants? The fees that it will charge is based on the uh, or, or, or charge on a per building basis. So so how about the fees payable by the tenants? Is it to be subject to negotiation between the owner and the and the tenants, uh, regarding the charges for the uh, cruise terminal and the shopping centre at uh, at uh, at uh, Taklong, for the housing uh, uh, society housing authority is not a government department, but we have signed an MOU with them earlier, and we do not treat them like uh, a private operator and charge them in that manner. And also regarding the cruise terminal, Mr. Lai already said that through the tourism commission, we would we would char charge them the fees uh, through the commission, and the tourism commission acts like uh, a landlord and charge the fees from the operators of the cruise terminal. In charging the tariffs, of course, uh, they will charge 
them according to our, our fees. But the EMC will, EMSC will split the proceeds with the Tourism Commission. Mr. Lai talked about the notional charges. In the bill, we have proposed the, uh, the fees to be charged. The method of calculation is that for all the users, uh, if they were a private operator, uh, we, we would charge them the total cooling fees, and then the, the, the fees recovered should be uh, able to cover the cost. The cruise term, regarding the cruise terminal, we're talking about a financial arrangement between different parts of the government, but in working out the sums, we treat them as if they were, uh, <coughs> uh, you know, private market users. Regarding the relationship between the cruise terminal and the Tourism Commission, uh, the contract that they have signed is like that of, <coughs> of a landlord and a tenant, and that is not. Uh, it has nothing to do with the uh, relationship between the government and the EMSD. It's basically the relationship between uh, the uh, cruise terminal and the Tourism Commission. Mr. Tony James, Mr. Wong Kong, and Mr. Wu Chiwai, followed by Ms. Sit Ho. Mr. Tony Chair, thank you. Regarding the district cooling services or the advantages of the services, of course I agree. Uh, uh, I fully agree that the that the DCA does provide such uh, advantages, but then there must be a legal basis. When you talk about the Kai Tech area, I think we are talking about. All the land there are owned by the government. When you sell a site or when you lease a site or the government were to use the site itself, there are already provisions governing the use of such sites and requiring them to pay. Why is it that you now need to come up with another bill? Could you explain in greater detail the legal basis for that? And secondly, you're using seawater uh, uh, for the cooling effect. I think that has already been done in other parts of the territory, for example, the Central District. So is it the first time that we're having the DCS uh, legislation and uh, that we do not find anywhere else in, in, in the territory? Or is it the case that it, when there are DCS in other districts, we need to come up with a separate uh, uh, legislation to cover them? And also, if we're going to use government land and using seawater for cooling, uh, then, uh, and thirdly, regarding cost recovery, including recovering costs for construction and operation. Well, I think the project is now, <clears throat> you know, under construction. So, so you're going to recover the capital costs in 30 years. So does the government have a an established policy that you would also add the interest, uh, uh, you know, uh, payable? Uh, this development takes time. Of course, you need to complete the facility, facility before you can use the seawater for cooling. So you need to make certain assumptions, and if that assumption were wrong, then you cannot increase the charges at the later stage for the amount that you have undercharged at the initial stage. If your estimate now is not too accurate, if you're too conservative, then at the later stage, the charges may be very expensive. Now you're telling us that uh, you will stand to gain and that, uh, that the fees payable will not be more expensive than the, the, the consumers, you know, uh, building their own cooling system. And thirdly, if there are problems with the supply of seawater, of course in the bill uh, you've covered that scenario, but if it is entirely due to human error, will the government be responsible? And if so, how would the government ensure that you know, when a problem arises, uh, uh, I'm sure you have all the backup system in place? Because should there be any, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, disruption and then uh, air conditioning is stopped uh, in, 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 in the summer season, then it would result in a lot of uh, uh, damages. Permission, Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. Uh, uh, you asked a few questions which we had actually explored uh, 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 thoroughly. The first question is about the legal basis. The legal advice from the DFJ is that there are two important uh, 
uh, parts for which we should provide legal authorities. Uh, first of all, uh, the question of fees. Our colleagues from DFJ may supplement here. According to the legal advice we have obtained, and we've also uh, made reference of the uh, charges imposed by the WSD, there is also a legal uh, basis for that. So, uh, so I, whenever government provides a service to the user, there is always a legal authority. Another important uh, le legal uh, opinion is that uh, the EMSD will need, may incur expenses. Uh, for example, the operating costs and the electricity tariff to be paid, the EMSD will have to pay for such fees. Through the imposition of a tariff, we hope to be able to offset the operating expenses. Again, we need a legal basis for that. Without a clear provision in the bill for that, the fees that we have recovered will go back to general revenue and it will not be able to help the to offset the operating expenses incurred by the EMST. We've sought legal advice on this point and, and, and the answer is that we did, do indeed uh, uh, need to, to impose the, 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 the charge. Uh, this is the DCS bill. The bill does not uh, <clears throat> spell out the DCS system at the Kaitak district. That is because we don't know whether in future in other districts uh, a, a similar DCS will be built. We hope that this bill could be more, could be wider in scope and in the schedule we stipulate that uh, that we are now proposing to set a fee for DCS services uh, and if DCS were systems were to build in other districts and other modes uh, and other charging mechanisms then we may uh, make changes in the schedules to cover DCS systems in other districts. The member also asked about the question of using seawater for chilling uh, purposes. That's not limited to Kaitak, that it is being also used in other areas. Now if um, this is well. This is the first time that the EMSD will be uh, building a DCS system, and uh, we have to operate a plant, not just using seawater for chilling effect. So, this is a new service uh, for us as well. The member also uh, referred about the charging. How do we determine the charging level? Well, we work out our charges based on assumptions. Now, what happens if we um, sort of make a mistake in our assumptions? Now, what I want to say is that we want to uh, balance the books. Um, one of the problems that may arise is that uh, there will be rising construction costs, but then the risk on that side is relatively low. As what Mr. Lai said, phase one has already been completed, and phase two is near completion, and phase three A, we've already sought uh, funding, and the works are going on. And as far as we understand, the EMSD is closely monitoring the costs, so we don't see any possibility of overspending. So. for the construction costs of the project. Actually, they are known already, so there is uh, is not very likely that it will fluctuate too much. Now, as for the charging, now if we undercharge in the beginning, it doesn't mean that we have to charge uh, higher and people have to pay extra in the future. Now, um, for many buildings like the Trade and Industry Tower and Hong Kong Children's Hospital, they will use the DCS system. And for um, business establishments and hotels, uh, as we were reported in the electrical, we would uh, um, consider um, having a condition in the condition of sale um, in the land lease that they should have a um, substations. Uh, build to connect to the DCS plant. Now, given that, and also with our proposed uh, charging level, and which uh, is lower than the conventional air cooled conditioning system, um, so based on all these factors, i.e., um, the benefits of um, the system. Um, people can have more flexibility in their building design and so on. So we are very confident that the, the uh, people will use our system. And we would try also try our best to ensure that the charging level will not, uh, 
will, will be set at the uh, right level, and we would uh, conduct a review of the tariffs uh, once every five years. Actually, you can see in the schedule that um, we lay out the um, proposed tariff and also the adjustment mechanism in the future. Well, it, will it be the case that our assumptions uh, will be wrong? Well, we can sort of tackle that problem by conducting a review. Once every five years, we'll look at the actual construction costs and the ex expenses and the revenue, and then we can come up with a better picture of where we are. Now, will, will it be possible that um, t uh, users will have to be sort of um, paying extra in the future to compensate our undercharging in the beginning? I don't think that's uh, very likely, because in the next 30 years, we'll be um, having um, all sorts of uh, we'll, we'll be having assumptions and um, calculation of cash flow for the next 30 years. So we would be able to generate a stable level of revenue in the future. It will not be the case that uh, we would be um, injecting more in the initial stage and we have to charge higher in the initial stage and then vice versa for the later stage. That would not be the case. We want to charge a, sta a stable level of fee for the for the entire 30 years. Now, as for the responsibility in relation to the whether the um, if the supply is not stable. Now, perhaps I'll defer to Mr. Lai to talk how we can ensure that there is a stable supply of uh, chilled water. Now, if there are problems arise, we would uh, be tackling them um, and get advice from all sides to do that. Mr. Lai, let me supplement. About um, water-cooled air conditioning system, Mr. Uh, Chair is right in pointing out that uh, um, Many users use uh, what's a system. Well, they are um, they build their own individual systems, but then for us this is a first um, system in Hong Kong, a regional or district uh, cooling uh, system. We use central pipelines uh, connecting to all area all buildings within an area. So we will be providing services to multiple users in several dozens, different uh, buildings, and so on. This is the first um, system of its kind in Hong Kong. Well, of course, uh, such a system is al al already up and running in other countries like Japan, Singapore, and other um, European and countries in the U.S. Uh, they are, of course, of, of varying scale. Now, for us, our system is um, rather large scaled in a way. Uh, we've visited overseas uh, similar systems, and by comparison, we are quite uh, uh, big in size. Now, as to reliability of our services, we are attaching a lot of importance to that. So we do have uh, two plants in the northern than part in the southern part, we have different uh, units, and if all um, are commissioned, we're talking about several dozen uh, units being installed, and we also have um, standby systems or reserve systems, and that would definitely will be more liable than individual system. Now, for a building, uh, the most you can have is say three to four, f five of plants, but for us, we have uh, several dozen units, so that would be uh, more standby capacity. Now, as for the pipelines, uh, um, that can be divided into two parts. Um, there are two to three sets of pipelines that will be standby. Uh, pipelines, you're just like um, electricity, right? There will be different ways of circuits, right? Well, so sorry, you haven't given us a time limit, uh, Chairman. Can I um, um, pose and follow up uh, this qu on this question about the legislative backing? My question is, why do we need a piece of legislation? I know we need a legal backing for whatever we do. Now, for some buildings now, they 
uh, maybe using uh, sea water to get the uh, to do ch uh, chilling and so on, and they still have legal backing, and the legal backing they have is in the form of a contract. I'm not saying that you don't need legal backing, but my question is, why do you have to use the uh, the uh, use the backing of a piece of legislation? Now you explain that uh, the bill is not just limited to Kaitak. Well, it may also be applied to areas or other systems in the future. No, uh, for existing systems, you would not cover that, right? Because that uh, has been in use for several um, dozen years, and and yet you are able to recover or charge uh, from those systems. No, so why? Why all of a sudden you need a piece of legislation? You said that. Uh, um, actually, you can um, add in a provision in your uh, sale of land uh, lease. Mm -hmm. So my question is, why do you need a piece of legislation? Another question has to do with um, costs. Um, my question is, would you be adding in the interest as well? Uh, there will be inflation, say, um, in the next 15 years. And would you be factoring in the interest as part of your calculation formula for the cost? <coughs> now, a lot of assumption is uh, is being made on the usage rate and also the cash flow. And your assumption is that you would be able to generate revenue and income. But say, if your assumption is mistaken, would those uh, uses be uh, uh, bearing the responsibility of your mistakes. Now, say, if um, nobody is interested in building a hotel there or using the shopping arcade there, then, well, the the few people, the users who are using this, this system will have to pay, pay exorbitant uh, fees. So, m my worry is that if, say, your assumption is mistaken, then um, maybe in the future there may be um, the land uh, may not be sold because of market conditions and so on, and the the, the users um, may have to pay a lot more because there are not that many users. Well, I think the administration understands your point. Uh, well, capacity charging is not something new, and this time round it's just that uh, the plant is of a, of a larger scale, and I don't think you have any difficulties in making uh, assumptions. And you also mentioned that there will be a review once every five years, and my worry is that uh, you will be asking people to make up for the shortfall in the income in the initial period. I don't think that you should worry too much about that. Well, Chairman, I am worried about people uh, for the users. Well, that there have been experience like that in the past. All right, when you look at the bill, then we can see if whether there is any room for us to sort of maneuver and take uh, into account your concerns. Although I haven't imposed a time limit, I don't want a member using taking up too much of our time in Q&A. Normally, we don't impose a time limit on such discussions. Chairman, can I don't want to take up too much of your time. Can you give me a reply in writing later, please? Sorry, speaker's not coming through. I think the uh, the administration understands your your well your question is not that I'm asking not uh, the administration not to respond. Um, my personal <coughs> view is that you don't have to be unduly worried about this. Now you raised two points. Uh, whether there will be fluctuations in the in the charges, and the second point is about uh, legal backing, and he wants a clarification um, on that. Can you uh, tackle these two points, <coughs> Mr. Chair? Talked about um, his in his worry about interest. There is a return rate, and actually, at the Environmental Affairs Panel, we has already have already. Um, talked about it. Um, the interest has to do with interest rate. Will that uh, be different in the future? <coughs> when we talk about interest, the major portion uh, has to do with 
the cost, and the cost has to do with the um, works, cost construction cost. The project life is thirty years, and the construction sort of um, concentrated in the first few years. <coughs> Um, if we talk about how to um, get a return in the 30, 30, next 30 years, how will interest impact on our construction costs? But then the construction costs well, would, just, uh, would, would be in the initial few years. Of course, it wouldn't be the case that uh, yeah, changes in interest rate in the <coughs> subsequent years will, 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 have, will, will have an impact. So on the question of whether or not there, there is, should be a legal authority on on the fees uh, to be charged, I'll ask my colleagues to uh, supplement. The question, well, I think I mentioned earlier on that we can, you know, <clears throat> uh, impose the charges by way of the contractual relationship. We're not talking about business transaction here. We're talking about cost recovery. And the legal advice we have obtained is that we need the legal authority, and the contract itself doesn't give us that legal authority to to impose the, the fees. There are also other provisions in the bill. For example, uh, we would be able to allow the EMSC to offset expenses <coughs> uh, by by using the 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 the, the pro proceeds of revenue. Uh, and if they go to general revenue, then we cannot use them to offset expenses incurred by individual departments. So we need this bill before the EMSD can, will not will, will, will be able to uh, so that the EMSD will not you know <coughs> uh, return the, uh, the the revenue generated to to general revenue. So there is a need for that. On the question of legal basis, perhaps uh, well on the twenty first of November. The environmental panel or the environmental bureau had written to our legal advisor, explaining the. Uh, it's actually a supplementary information uh, uh, regarding the DCS bill, and the DFJ has already given advice uh, relating to the legal authority issue, and that is uh, pursuing to a case law in the House of Lords. It is stipulated that there should be a clear and explicit statutory authority for the government to impose charges. And based on this uh, legal advice, it would, would be necessary for the administration to introduce a new piece of legislation to provide legal backing for the government to collect charges from non-domestic users of the DCS at the Kaitech. Development that is in the letter dated uh, the uh, uh, 21st of November. Perhaps uh, senior government council could also respond to that. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your question. I'd like to thank the chairman also for reminding us of the government's uh, response. As the chairman said, according to the House of Lords. Uh, 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 Decision on McCarthy and in the case of McCarthy and Stone Development Limited versus Richmond upon the Thames uh, London Borough Council, uh, clear and explicit statutory authorities required. I uh, say in the, uh, a very good example would be the imposition of Texas. You need legal authority before the government can impose charges from its citizens, it, and in order to pay for for government works for other charges. For example, we are now proposing to provide a DCS, and we need to impose a charge. I think we, for details, we we'll need to look at the details of each uh, case law. But a simple principle uh, we may look at is whether the government role is that of a uh, you know a, a private party. Or, or, or a, a provider of public services. Uh, for example, when the government sells land, I, I'm not too familiar with those examples. But the sale or, or land, sale of land or land auction is purely a, a, a commercial transaction. But for the DCS system, Ms. Ma already told members that. This is a, uh, you know, a, a, a system which supplies uh, <clears throat> to the entire district, uh, as in the case of the water services department, which provides services uh, <clears throat> for a very large territory. So in this particular case, it is most important that we have clear legal authority so that members of the public 
after <coughs> receiving the service may challenge the government in court for uh, for the charges it imposed. So we therefore need the legal uh, provisions to clearly spell the, 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 the basis for the fees payable. Ms. Ma also said that other than pro providing for the fees payable, uh, it also provides that the government can use the fees received to offset the operating expenses. According to the, the, the General Revenue Ordinance, it is stipulated that all fees uh, collected on behalf of the government will need to go, be paid back to the General Revenue. So without this uh, provision in the bill, then the, the fees collected on behalf of the government will not, cannot be used to offset any operating expenses. They will first have to go to General Revenue first. Other than the collection fees, there are other things for which we need a legal authority. If you read the, the, the uh, say, for example, the administrative arrangements for the DCS, uh, I, uh, what is involved, would, would there, uh, uh, you may need, need legal authorities to provide for the offenses and also uh, to provide for the, uh, the, for, for the way it's going to be administered. Legal advisor, I think members would have noted that the government has sent us a letter on November the 21st in which they only refer to one single case law uh, in the House of Laws and this is a British case law uh, and it's not a case law uh, or, 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 or decision made by the CFA in Hong Kong. Today I've heard a lot more about uh, that I've heard that the government is already uh, providing DCA service uh, in other areas and the DMJ just now uh, provided supplementary justification which is more than they've said in this uh, letter where they only refer to a single case law. I therefore would like some time to go back and consider what I've heard today and so that at the next time, at our next meeting, I can provide members with a supplementary legal opinion so that members can further discuss the issue. Yes, I think this is a serious issue and, uh, and in, well, indeed the letter is rather simple and for us to discuss it today, I, I think it would be better if we could discuss it uh, next, at the next meeting when uh, paper is ready. Mr. Wong Ting Kong. I think we have spent too much time, 24 minutes on one single question. Although you have not set a time limit, but I think you need to be more efficient, Chairman. Well, if I also take 24 minutes, I don't think many members will be able to ask any questions. Well, it, it depends on how many members will like to ask questions. Never, never mind, Mr. Wong, please go ahead. Now, first of all, the DCS appears to be efficient and and uh, economical. According to my own personal experience, for each square meter of cooling charge, which is $20 uh, or $2 per square foot, I don't think that is, uh, I think that is cheaper than many other buildings. Uh, to pay uh, for less than $2 per square foot of cooling charge is indeed very cheap. But, but still I have some questions. Now just in case the system breaks down, And if I have installed my own air con, if I were to install my own air conditioning system, would that be in breach of the law? In the area to be served by the DCS, if I privately install my own air conditioning system, would that be an offence? Would that be prohibited? And this air con system include. I'm not saying that I'm installing a central cooling system for the entire building. I just want to <clears throat> install a window type air conditioner at my premises. Would that be an offence? Or even if I were to install a, you know, a mobile a cooling unit, would that be uh, an offence? Must I uh, always use the rely on the DC system? And secondly, other than Providing cooling, would, does it also provide heating? Uh, you know, as service as well. Uh, is it a reverse cycle uh, system? And thirdly, 
you are working on the basis of a cost recovery period of 30 years. Therefore, such types of machineries and plants, are you sure that they can have a life expectancy of 30 years? I rarely hear that equipment could be used for 30 years. Uh, I, I'm just worried that the 30 year payback period may be too long. I, I also understand that the present legislative proposal. I, think, I, I understand that all government revenue has to go back to the Treasury, uh, but this time uh, we are, you know, providing for a provision to uh, to stipulate that the fees collected will not go back to the general revenue. Well, this is not a new mode of operation, but and I think it is necessary. When you supply to the non-government users, there may be all kinds of uh, possible scenarios. For example, the question of liability and debts and so on. If we have to, if the government has to deal with them, And I think it's a lot more expedient for the authority in, 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 in charge of the DCA system to deal with those issues. P.S. Thank you, Mr. Wong, for the question and his uh, uh, comments. Uh, I think Mr. Wong put it very aptly, saying that the fees collector should be specifically used for the uh, operation, to pay for the operation of the system. Our, what we propose to do is that in the uh, <coughs> uh, 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 the, 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 the lease document, we would require uh, the users uh, to be connected to the digital system, and they would need to pay for the building of their own substations. And within the same building, uh, if we're going to build a cooling system, I think that is only 10% of the cost. If the building wants to install other cooling system, whether it's winter type air conditioners or mobile uh, coolers, that would not be an offense. But through the lease document, we would require them to be connected to the DCS. Uh, uh, but that doesn't mean they would not be allowed to use or install air, winter type air conditioners. Our, what we're saying is that, uh, well, if they did that, they would need to incur additional expenses. It may affect the design of the building. It may not be an offense. But from the cost effectiveness uh, perspective, it may not be worth uh, uh, doing that. Regarding the supply of heating and the 30 li year life expectancy, Mr. Lai can, can answer those questions. Thank you, Mr. Wong. We're talking about a cooling system, and given the circumstances in Hong Kong, basically we, ha we have not, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, we do not intend to provide heating. It is only a cooling system. Regarding the life expectancy, we look at it uh, over uh, the overall uh, situation. The 30-year uh, life expectancy is the basis for cost recovery. I agree with Mr. Wong that the system involves different machineries and equipments and structures, and the life expectancy of buildings should be more than 30 years. It should be at least 50. Regarding the mains. Again, they can last for a long time. They should be able to be used for 30 years. For the generating units, the units that we're now using are large units. They are centralized units, which upon completion, they will be the largest aircon units uh, uh, in Hong Kong. And we expect that uh, their life expectancy will be much longer than the typical air conditioners, and they're relatively more expensive. So we expect that it is reasonable that they could be used that they could be used for thirty years. Of course, there will be components like the pumps and the heat exchangers and so on. Uh, those may not be able to last for thirty years. They may need to be replaced. But in the course of operation, if they need to be replaced, we would. 
uh, you know, include uh, such expenses into the total operating cost. Mr. Wong. When I said that, said that I, I would, I, if I install my own air conditioners, I, uh, what I'm saying is that, well, in the least uh, document you already require the, the 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 tenants or the owners to use the DC system, and they should not incur ex extra expenses to to build their own system. But some uh, business uh, operators have said that because of the layout. Of the premises, the air vents uh, for uh, uh, because of the fitting out of the premises, the uh, the uh, cool air could not be distributed evenly. They may need to make some other arrangements, and I don't know whether or not that is I illegal. Uh, according to your response just now, it's not an offence. That is, they have the right to. Uh, to uh, install smaller uh, cooling units to make up for any, uh, uh, you know, deficit in in cooling, and if the system doesn't provide for heating, then have you consider expanding the system to provide for heating as well, even though it's not very cold uh, in in winter as in the case of Buffalo City. <laughs> Well, while Hong Kong's winter can also be um, cold uh, too, so would you consider adding in the heating facility while well, giving the existing equipment? Um, can we also provide both heating and cooling um, effect? Can you um, install um, heating facility in the future, Mr. Lai? This is very much a cooling system, so we provide chilled water and not heat hot water to buildings. And through ex heat exchanges, the chilled water is turned into um, water for used uh, for use by individual buildings for providing air conditioning. Now, if we are to provide heating function, the individual buildings have to, say, install f thermal facilities within the building. Well, that can be done on the building level and not at the central plant level. Well, that can be done at the central plant. Mr. Wu Chi Wai. Thank you, Chairman. I have several questions. The first one. The bill. Um, caters to the needs for non-government buildings. Can you provide us with uh, the following statistics? Um, within the Kaitak area, the the um, capacity, the cooling capacity for government buildings and cooling capacity for non-government uh, uh, buildings. That will affect your charging scheme because you said that um, the charging model is to um, enable EMSD to balance its books. So this is a piece of important um, uh, statistics. Now, you have already started uh, providing the cooling services. So can you uh, give us more information on um, the the actual operation of, of your supply to the cruise terminal and also Qinglong shopping center? And what is the present um, charging arrangement? Now, if it is a government property, how is charging being done? Would the same sort of principles be applied? Will the uh, revenue collected be also uh, be uh, put in the pocket of the EMSD? If this is not the case, then it will you will impose heavier pressure on the non-government users. So the EMSD. 
mm. will get revenue from both um, government users and non-government users. Would you be charging them on the same basis? Now, if this is not the case, you may be charging more on the government users to cross-subsidize the non-government users. So I think uh, you should clarify this point. You are talking about a 30-year cost recovery period, and 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 you would use the cost recovery period and also the operating costs to calculate your charging levels. Also, have you assessed that once the DCS is up and running, would the um, the uh, will the uh, land developers gain an advantage in terms of GFA? Now, if that is the case, what what kind of resources are we talking about? Fourthly. This uh, system only provides cooling services. Uh, would uh, the cooling level be set at a static level? So, well, in shopping centers, uh, we normally talk about a uh, sort of uh, air conditioning uh, level at a stable level. For government buildings and non-government buildings, they need air conditioning. And uh, if they need uh, air conditioning service, they will use the GFA to build some air conditioning facilities so that they can, uh, well, provide a more sort of com comfortable cooling effect. Well, we said that uh, through the conditions of uh, land use, making a certain provision there, then um, the users are definitely going to use the DCS uh, Well, you are not sure about the um, the costs uh, to be uh, incurred. PAS, thank you, Mr. Wu, for your questions. I would first uh, respond uh, to the question on charging. As for the technical questions about cooling, air conditioning, and so on, then Mr. Lai can take those questions. First of all, in the Kaitak area, um, Government buildings versus non-government buildings. <coughs> well, this is 1.73 million uh, gross floor area, and that is uh, calculated based on the development parameters for Kaitak. A non-domestic gross floor area needing air conditioning uh, services, government buildings, 20%. There are other public facilities, some 10 percent, and government buildings plus public uh, facilities, a total of 40 percent. The, the remaining 60 percent is for um, commercial buildings, shopping uh, plazas, offices, and hotels. So that's basically the distribution. As to how we uh, come up with the benchmark um, or baseline charging levels. Uh, commercial buildings um, will be charged based on the provisions in the bill. Now, as to whether such charging level is applicable to government departments, and we're just talking about arrangement between one government department and another department. We want uh, the user adopt the user pays principle. We don't want um, public money to subsidize uh, this service. So the, the situation is rather complicated. When we calculate the um, tariff or the charge, uh, whether it's uh, government or uh, public um, uh, facilities, when we calculate the cash flow, 
Uh, we assume that they will be paying the same charges as those for um, private organizations. So there, if there is a need to adjust the tariff or charge in the future, for example, if we want to increase the charge because of rising costs, uh, rising operating costs, the increased cost would not just be borne by the private um, organizations. So, so the, the additional costs will be spread out uh, among all including both government and non-government buildings. So this is the way we calculate it. Now, for EMSD, oh, there is an arrangement between it and other government departments. We will be focusing um, on the consumption charge. Why? Now, the uh, DCS uh, plant uh, is built, and the costs um, for EMSD are mostly operating costs, for example, electricity costs, management costs for the operators, and so on. So these are the operating costs, not the construction costs. So in the future, when, uh, whatever uh, income that EMSD collects or generates, so that will be all for to offset the operating costs. Now, if there is a surplus, then the EMSD will hand over the surplus to the general revenue account. So this uh, situation is a bit complicated here. The well, construction costs to be paid out in the first few years, and the operating costs spread um, for the next 30 years. And then the, when the term comes to the costs, then, well, all the costs will be spread over a period of 30 years. We would try to also use a an appropriate interest level and then come and then come up with a figure for the uh, tariff for this year so this is the way we calculate it also well, there will not be the scenario where there will be an adjustment in the charge and then it's just uh, the the adjustment it applies only to certain buildings well everyone has to pay extra or pay less everybody is treated I like. Now, as to the cooling and heating uh, technical aspects, and Mr. Lai, can you take uh, answer? Thank you, Mr. Wu, for your question. You talked about uh, GFA. We don't have a G special GFA consideration. If the the user uses this uh, DCS, well, the the user will be saving up on uh, building because it doesn't have to build its own. Plants, chilling plants, or um, heat um, sort of uh, dispersing uh, facilities and so on. So that would help uh, save up some construction area or GFA. And also, construction costs can be saved as too. Mr. Wu uh, referred to the air conditioning uh, situation. Let me try to answer you briefly. This is a central air conditioning system, we need a central chilling plant, and then it distributes its um, chilled water to, to the different floors of the building, and then there is a machine in the different floor to send the cooled air to the, uh, to the different units. So the, the air um, sort of uh, facility, uh, it has a thermal uh, facilities, will sort of adjust the temperature and so on for each individual uh, unit. The district cooling surfaces will replace the chiller plants of this building, but then the building does have to have its own air uh, sort of machine. And so the Adjustment of the temperature in each floor or unit has to be done by the individual building. So all we are doing is to um, send the chilled water to the building, and we would control the temperature of the chilled water, and based on the, um, the the cooling needs of the individual buildings, we will design the pipelines, the heat exchanges, and uh, related facilities so that adequate chilled water can be supplied to the buildings. So let me clarify. Whether you have this system or not, the individual building must properly install uh, some basic uh, 
um, air conditioning facilities, including air ducts and so on. And then gets uh, the chilled water from the central plant so that it can um, send uh, cooled air to the different floors. So the, the, the great disadvantage is that it can uh, save up on the space uh, for building the chiller plants, right? Correct. <coughs> so there is also this um, need for heat dispersal. Um, well, normally, a uh, heat dispersal machine is needed to be installed on the rooftop. Now, that is no longer needed. So we can um, do the dis heat dispersal function also <coughs> at the central plant. Now, for the operating fund of the EMSD, well, there are people who um, need to buy services from EMSD, and they uh, don't normally don't do it through an internal arrangement. They have to actually pay the EMSD. But uh, would the DS, uh, DCA system also follow the same mechanism? Our trading fund, we have another provision governing the trading fund. And that governs the service that we provide to other public organizations and how we charge them. That, of course, uh, I understand. It has it is is not related to the DCS bill. The DCS system actually uh, provides <coughs> uh, chilling to uh, non-domestic users. The trading fund. Uh, it's about the. Relationship between the government and the EMSC trading fund. Uh, the EMSC will, through the DCA system, will serve both government premises and non-government premises. According to Mrs. Ma, it would appear that the cooling charges for government buildings and premises will not appear in the account of the EMSC's trading fund. So under what circumstances will we know uh, about the cooling uh, <coughs> uh, fees uh, incurred by these different depart government departments? I understand that there's a separate uh, piece of legislation governing the trading fund. So what I'd like to know is whether or not in, under the DCA system, the cooling charges paid by government departments will not need to be paid into the trading fund. The lie. We've already said that uh, under the EMSD, uh, the EMSD operates uh, according to uh, a trading fund. The trading fund itself is a service provider, but the DCA system in at Kaitak, uh, the service provider is actually an operator. Uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, to be uh, invited to operate the system by the MST. So it's different from the services uh, uh, provided by the trading fund. In other words, the service provider is not a trading fund. In other words, there will be a separate uh, account. Well, in that case, I'd like to know more about the structure. So the MST appoints a service provider to operate the DCS system. And the service provider, I mean, on on what basis uh, does it provide a service? Does will the government pays for the construction of the whole system using public funds? And it's not going to be operated by the EMSC trading fund, but rather a company under the EMSC or, or I don't know what. I don't understand the relationship there. Perhaps you can give us a paper explaining clearly the relationship, and also the service provider. How is he going to be uh, appointed, or, or is it going to be part of the government or not? I think you need to explain all those parts. Why don't we ask the administration to give us a more detailed paper, uh, uh, so, uh, so that we can discuss that at the at our next meeting. I understand that this is a rather complex uh, issue. Ms. Sito, before Ms. Sito asks a question, 
uh, I will allow sufficient time for Ms. Ho to ask questions, but I'd like to deal with certain procedural matters first. Uh, that is, we, we may we consider, we need to consider inviting a deputation to submit the views, and the Secretariat has already proposed a list of deputations to be invited. And if uh, members are invited to make recommendations, and we will also put up an announcement on our website, and we also will extend invitations to all the 18 district councils. Are there any other individuals or deputations which uh, uh, do members think that we need to invite them? Yes, Chairman. I think we should also. <coughs> I don't think many of the green groups have expressed an interest on the DCS, but still, I think we need to ask them. Good. So, if you propose to have a meeting with the deputations, the Secretariat uh, propose uh, that we set the date for the 16th of December at 10.45 to uh, uh, 12.30. And we may also consider the 13th of, Je or rather 13th of January 2015, a Tuesday at 10.45 again to 12.45, and also the 29th of January 2015 from 8.30 to 10.30. I think we, we will have a meeting with the District Council on the same day, so I think we should be able to do that in the morning. Ms. Sito, I'd like to ask whether Ms. <coughs> uh, Mr. Leung has a question to ask. For if Ellen has a question, I'll be happy to, to sh Give him half the time. He has already indicated that he would like to speak. Okay, Ms. Ho. Chairman, I think you need to really exercise better time management, although I appreciate that you've not uh, set any time limit. Well, some members have asked many questions, and they really raise our many important questions, and we therefore require need more time for the government to respond. I would like to ask whether or not uh, individual tenants have the option of new, not using the DCS. In the, in the previous term, the Secretary told us categorically that there was this option. At the panel, he said that to us. But I note that in the bill, the so-called authorized uh, uh, tenants or users is not in your interpretation, but it's in the uh, uh, extract at the back. I don't know why, for such an important def uh, you know, definition, you put it into the, uh, the, the extract. Uh, have we found it in the interpretation part? Yes. Okay. I'm worried that I might have missed that. Uh, for the users, uh, the uh, authorized uh, users will be the owners of the buildings, the tenants, and and also the. Uh, so that's what you say uh, in Schedule Two, Section Nine, approved consumers. That's what you said here. And. During the last term, the secretary said that other than the shopping centres, the hospitals and the schools, he has another <clears throat> aim to extend it to the HOS and public housing estates. And in your bill, you also make reference to the domestic premises. That is, the, the supply could be extended to the domestic premises in future. Uh, for example, when you go into a premises uh, for inspection, you may not be able to enter domestic premises. So I would I assume that you may extend this to domestic premises in future. But then you must give people an option as to whether to use the service. Having heard the discussion for almost two hours, uh, my impression is that all the officials told us that the, the owner of the entire this is something between the owner of the entire building and the individual consumers and, and, the, and the contract between the two of them. But what I'd like to ask whether or not each individual premises can have its own uh, meter and choose whether or not to use the DCS service. Uh, in the past, when we heard about uh, the, uh, this, when, whenever we have discussion about the DCS, uh, we always heard that the users can have a choice. Mr. Wong Ting Kong asked whether or not it's an offense not to use the service. He said no, but then they'll have to pay more. This is tantamount to forcing them to use your DCS service. Uh, once the building is connected to the DCS system, uh, uh, then 
and in the lease uh, document, it is already a requirement. But every month, at least you should give the users the, the, the option of not using the service, especially for the domestic premises in the future. So what is the government's position now? Uh, do you intend to give such an option to the, the tenants or the consumers? Legal advisor? I'd like to make some, give some supplementary information uh, so that the officials can give a more uh, comprehensive answer to Ms. Hosko. I don't need an answer now. I think they can give us a written uh, paper. Going back to the interpretation section, buildings include the parts of the building. I also like to take this opportunity to ask the government to define clearly whether or not you are referring to uh, a building uh, you know managed by a single person or is it a case that some uh, tenants may choose to use the service and others choose not to use the unit and if that's the case will you charge them individually according to the framework provided for under the bill why don't the administration give us a written response after the meeting so that we can discuss this uh, um, in more great detail next time chairman we have a whole list of technical questions. That is the owners of the building, the developers, and the individual tenants. And what is the legal relationship in between the two? Uh, is it, uh, is it only, uh, is that, are they only governed by the, 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 uh, the uh, lease contract? And also, uh, would you require the developer to uh, provide for independent, independent meters so that the tenants can choose whether or not to use the service. Well, some people may choose not to use the DCS system, uh, uh, even though it's more environmentally friendly. And in winter, do you only provide for uh, 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 you know, ventilation and not cooling? And also, what about heating in winter? And also, uh, well, other members already asked a question about uh, uh, the individual tenants. Perhaps the administration can give us a, a written response uh, for our next meeting. I think they should uh, explain both the legal aspect and the technical aspects. Ellen Leung. Uh, colleagues who were uh, in the council during the previous term would remember that when this uh, item was uh, uh, endorsed by the PWSC and the FC, members have expressed that the concern that this could become, uh, you know, Hawaii elephant. I still have that concern now that it's going to be a white elephant. I said that I said that the chairman should allow the administration to ask Mr. Tony Chair's question, which is very the very important question of why do we need uh, the legislation. I'm happy that the legal advisor will, will, is going to explore uh, further on this, and senior counsel from the DFJ have provided us with some new information. I'm sure Mr. C would understand, and perhaps he can take this back to the DFJ. The government, you know, and uh, you know. You know, it has two types of uh, acts. First of all, acts by the government and the business acts or commercial uh, acts, uh, you know, conducted by the government. You are now not uh, prohibiting people for prohibiting people from installing their own air conditioners, and other people can also compete with you. This is actually, uh, you know, a business act. Or, or so, if I have an office in West Kowloon. Uh, and there is an air con uh, supplier agreeing to uh, provide me with uh, you know uh, the service at two dollar per square foot. I'll accept that, of course. What the government is now doing is 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 providing a commercial, uh, something which is commercial in in nature and is competing with potential competitors. Uh, when we talk about water and electricity, I mean, it is well, water is supplied by a government department, but uh, supply of electricity is not uh, uh, done by the government. 
but you do not enact a piece of legislation governing how Hong Kong Electric would agree with the tenants to provide for the service and provide for appeals committee and so on. So there is already a difference, already a difference between the, the supply of water and electricity. It's just that within this very very narrow scope, you are going to build a DCS, and for that for this purpose, you are going to enact a piece of legislation. I think I will need uh, more justification to be uh, in order that I'll be convinced that we should enact this piece of legislation. I mean, the same could apply to uh, electricity. I mean, they could be provided for by private companies. And Mr. Wuchiwai's question. I think uh, I'll echo uh, Mr. Wu's uh, point. Uh, that is why I said the EMSC's training fund is always there. Why is that it's not uh, 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 paid into the training fund? Can the revenue generated be paid into the training fund? I, I don't understand. Well, he has already promised to give us, you know, further information uh, uh, for our discussion at the next meeting. Another point of concern, as also um, raised by Mr. Tony Chair, 30 years seems to be a long period. Say, if 10 years later that there is a very uh, new state of art technology coming up. And we're worried that uh, this will become an elephant, and and this uh, technology, what well, the service that we're providing, becomes outdated. What w what will happen then? You can't force people to use your district cooling services, and you can't compete because you have an old technology. So will this become or deteriorate into a white elephant? Well, we don't have time now, but perhaps this is something that we should deal with further on. I agree that we should hold a public hearing. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, um, public hearing to be scheduled on the 16th of December. So I think we've just uh, reached uh, the, the closing time here. Legal advisor, I would like to remind the chairman that that the government departments and also the D of J can uh, write a paper on the legal uh, justifications um, for this uh, service. The need for um, proceeding with a piece of legislation. This point has been raised by a number of members, so I think the D of J should give us more details on that, uh, Ms. Sito. Chairman, I think we should hold uh, meetings more frequently because they are uh, planned to uh, start charging July next year. Without the bill, they can't uh, do that. Now, once the, the budget uh, is announced, then we will spend all the time on debating on the budget. So I am worried that if we can't do this before the budget debate, then I just don't know when we will be able to meet with uh, their proposed timetable. Perhaps in December and January we can hold one more meeting. Perhaps we can uh, try to identify some time slots. I think I hope that before the budget debate, the bill can be uh, submitted to the electrical for sitting. So much for this meeting. Thank you, government officers, for, for attending.